Now he's dead and gone. That tab has closed. That tab no longer exists. So at the end of the day, they're relying on savings. And the savings, you know, all outgoing, very little incoming, so it'll be all scaled down. So at the end of the day, how long can the family tahan with the initial saving that they have? Okay. Sometimes it may not be a lot. It's not like you've got bucket loads of cash kept in the bank. Right? Sometimes they end up with that money, end up buying house, la, car, la, and all that, which uh, if you buy too many cars, it will depreciate in value. Uh, or you buy some funny things, which when you want to sell at a much value, <laughs> sometimes you get into the wrong investment. So therefore, the family doesn't have much to live on. Now. Okay? Money will, will reduce quickly. And the other thing is, the buyer uh, wants to buy the shares. Sometimes, genuinely, he, he does want to buy at a good price, uh, but he doesn't have the money. The buyer here would be the remaining shareholders in the company who want to purchase the dead shareholder shares when he dies. Okay? So, he doesn't have pre-arranged funding, um, he will have a problem buying, he will have a problem offering a good price to the family to buy over. Right? So this, all these things are problems which we want to prevent when we do a buy-sell plan for the client. When we have a buy-sell plan for the client, uh, that solution should cover these things. For one, allow the business to continue and, when, and also have a confirmed sale of the shares by the remaining shareholders based on the price that was agreed, uh, which is under group 2 here. And in the buy-sell plan, it should also state when should the buyer buy the shares, when should the seller be selling the shares. These, these are things we call trigger events, which are usually, of course, death is one, the other one is disabled. Either you are disabled, totally permanently disabled, not patakati only, it's basically lose two limbs or three limbs or whatever, or blind, okay, or bedridden, can't get up, including comatose and all that, where you cannot work anymore for duration of time, and recovery is close to close to zero at the end of the day, there's no chance of recovery, then you should be selling your shares in the company. No point holding on to those shares. Okay? And funding. <coughs> Here the seller wants to sell at a particular price that was agreed. Now the thing is, the buyer, when he wants to buy the shares, he needs to think about where he's going to get money to buy. Uh, so what happens is that part of this structure, we encourage client to look at buying insurance as providing funding. Okay? I'll, I'll deal more with the insurance after, but looking at insurance, it will help uh, the buyers to buy the shares of the seller easily. Otherwise, it will be cash, right? If the buyer can buy the shares based on cash, when a shareholder suddenly meets an accident dies and his value is five million, you are the buyer, can you come up with five million straight away and buy within the next one, two months? Uh, a lot of our clients that we ask, not possible lah. They go to bank, bank, good time, the bankers want to come to us and ask us to lend money. Why not we lend you money? <laughs> time not so good, you want to see the banker, the banker also close the door. Alright, they don't really want to meet you at the for discussion. Okay, so you end up selling assets, which will take time. So the easier way to make sure you have that 5 million ready in the future, have an insurance policy. Okay? Pay a small premium. Okay, when the person who is insured dies, the five million materialize. Okay, all right. So as opposed to borrow money, have your own saving of five million. And usually, have saving of five million doesn't happen. The moment you see a lot of money, you want to take and buy something already. Most of the time, this is a trigger event yeah. can be on on the diagnosis of a serious illness. Can it be also be a trigger event? Yes. Uh, but our feedback from our clients, is, especially the Singaporean clients, I say. I cannot critique also, never mind, still can work one. I don't want to sell my share yet. I only want to sell my share when I tabule kerja already, bed ridden, cannot move also, I then sell. Right? So, a uh, lot of the time, we tell client, it's good to have critical enough coverage, but maybe not to sell your shares, just to use it for your medical needs. Okay? For the buy sell plan, you just cover death and TBD, la, permanent disability. That's good enough already. Okay, so at least you've got some part of money for illness. See whether hopefully you recover. Okay. And then what happens is, 
In this whole arrangement, we put in a power of attorney arrangement so that whoever that sells the shares, his shares will be quickly be transferred to the buyer. So that's where the trustee comes in for the whole arrangement to transfer the shares of the buyer, oh sorry, of the seller to the buyer. Right. And then finally, uh, the seller who sells the share, most of the time will be dead and gone. The money that we collected from the sale of the shares, the client has to give us instruction how do you want to give out the funds. Right? Okay. But the seller can't collect the funds. You don't want the seller's estate or family members collecting the funds also because it's like who is the authorized person to collect the funds from the seller, uh, from the buyer. Right? Otherwise you end up stating down in the agreement who is the representative of the seller to collect the funds. Which sometimes client want to change his mind becomes difficult, especially when he's in an agreement. You have to get the other shareholders to <laughs> and make changes. So messy. So what we do is we put in a trust where the client tells us his personal instruction who is to receive this money, how to give out the money. And we're also mindful that the money collected from the sale of the shares, it's not about, it's not 100,000, 200,000. The average uh, value that we have, all of these cases we've done, it is about, the average is about, uh, what we call this is about 1.2 million in terms of a person's share value when he wants to sell. So imagine if when the shareholder dies, uh, the buyer pays the wife or the husband a check worth 1.2 million. There will not be preservation of this 1.2 million. They will check the moment they bank in, cash it out, spend. <laughs> there will be very little preservation. I can tell you that. Okay? Okay? No one has seen, they've not got hold of that, too many zeros behind the check before at the end of the day. They'll go back. Alright? Okay? So all of it will be wasted. The children that the client wanted to benefit will not be able to benefit. So with this trust, we tell client, we give you own instruction on how you want to distribute. We will advise you accordingly. Huh? Now, the trigger events that I mentioned just now, uh, usually this, the common ones, that's disability, critical illness, like I mentioned, retirement. <laughs> retirement, um, very seldom we put retirement in the agreement. The reason is because the clients that we meet tend to be the age between 30 plus to about mid 50s. Uh, very rare we see clients who are 60 plus 70. No point for us to do this bicep for you also because the moment one guy dies, the other guy who gets it is already 70 plus, going to go himself. So why bother <laughs> buying that particular share? So when we have young clients who are like 30 plus or 50 plus, when they buy over somebody's share, they can see at least a good 10 years future ahead lah, that if they live that long, this business they can grow it and then pass it on to their kids if they want. If they're 60, 70 years old, chances of dying pretty high already. Okay, I don't know why bother buying somebody else's share. Most probably I want to sell to you and get out. Right, instead of acquiring. Uh, not so common ones are this. They lock between jail girls, uh, divorce, bankruptcy, loss of professional license. Um, all this, I usually do not, I ask like, try not to put it in, uh, okay? Put in the, the main ones, death disability. The reason why death and disability, one is insurable, including critical illness. All this, not insurable. You have to pay cash. Plus, defining deadlock could be a bit, uh, could be a, it's going to be a tough thing, at the end of the day, to define for the client to come to a common agreement to be written what amounts to a deadlock and who is going to be the buyer, who is going to be the seller in the event of a deadlock. Okay? Sometimes you have a 50-50 shareholding, I know it's going to be an issue already. Right? Divorce. Uh, because you're going to put divorce in an agreement, you are actually going to dig yourself a big hole. Okay? Especially if the, the client is a male shareholder, he's married. The reason is, for non-Muslims, uh, when you get divorced, what happens is that your wife will claim against you in terms of the divorce. The wife will be able to claim two things. One is alimony, two, division of matrimonial assets. Okay? The division of matrimonial assets now depends on how much did the wife contribute monetarily and in other ways to help you build your wealth. So if your marriage is kind of along with your wife, maybe 10 years, 15 years, 
chances of a contribution is percentage wise very high low. Otherwise you won't be staying married that long, right? <laughs> okay. So when you get divorced, you're gonna get whacked on the guys. <laughs> okay? The, the in Malaysia we don't have a standard percentage where the court just say okay half. In Western countries you do. Here uh, it's very much up to the judge to decide what's the quantum. Okay. Um, basing on case law, quantum is one third and half law. Okay, but you get a judge who probably just went through a bad divorce, and if that judge is a lady judge, okay. <laughs> you get a male judge, then maybe you're, you're okay lah. <laughs> you probably say, okay, probably 10,000, let's say. <laughs> okay, so very much it depends on, on the judge. Okay, now part of the shares of the company can amount to matrimonial assets in the, in, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the divorce. We encourage like not to put it into divorce into the buy sell because in the buy sell you would have a formula how to determine the price of how much uh, what's the value you want to sell your shares to. Okay, that that that, that formula should not be different for death for divorce for TPD. Should be the same. You can't say that TPD sell at this price, divorce sell the whole price. Okay, you are asking for a dropper. So I rather they don't put it into the agreement when the guy gets divorced and if you know his wife is going to go after his shares because it's valuable then negotiate outside and sell and buy at a different price whatever price you, you want to you put it in the agreement you're digging yourself a hole you end up the buyer that is end up paying a very high price okay all right so i wouldn't encourage that same thing for bankruptcy now. okay for both events it's not like the seller is going to get to keep the money anyway. The person who gets the divorce, the husband, is not going to get to keep the money. The wife is going to kasa it. I don't know they. Bankruptcy, most probably the creditors will take it. I don't know they. So you pay so much, uh, chances are you, your share is not going to be injured by your partner. His creditors or his ex-spouse will probably claim it. I don't know they. Okay. And then loss of professional license. These are more for law firms, accountants and all that coming in at the end of the day where they lose their license that maybe that particular partner should be selling off his interest to the other remaining partner. 